Hi, my name is Mike Abin, and welcome to my KSP campaign. We are up here at Yoy Station orbiting the moon with Burke, Wilman, and Shellcal, who last episode worked very, very hard to put this station together. And now I'm going to keep putting them to work because we're going down to the lunar surface to visit Tycho Magnetic Anomaly number seven to fulfill a contract. Yeah, I got a number of these. Uh, do some surface EVA contracts, and I want to start banging them off. Now, last episode where uh, we did a lot of rendezvousing and had to fix up some of my botched mistakes from the episodes before, I that was kind of fun. And sometimes that's what KSP is all about. It's about messing up and then dealing with your mess ups and trying to make things work anyway. But sometimes also it's about pushing forward, and that's what this episode is going to be about. I really do want to get this game moving in a forward direction so we can start doing some things new. And right here, well, this is stuff you've seen before, so we're going to be moving through it very, very quickly. Uh, near the waypoint, that does look fairly hilly, so I think we'll put down here, especially considering the fact that it is dark. Oh, we are in the poles too, so we do have some new science to get. I've never been in the poles of uh, the moon before, so that's great. Now the waypoint is a little over five kilometers away, so we'll use one of these KIX, KIS, I can get it out, extra propellant canisters to help us on our journey. Whoa, whoa, this is a hole. <laughs> we, are, we are going down a hole. And then it came out kind of funny, even though I did find this thing obviously down here at the bottom of the hole, no matter what I did, getting close to it, I couldn't get the contract to fulfill. So eventually I just kind of, well, Alt F12 this thing. I mean, I'm clearly fulfilling, I've done a number of these before, I am fulfilling the conditions of the contract. There we go. And then it came time, of course, for Burke to head back to the Kegel 4. And we started collecting some science here from the poles. We collect a lot of the standard science, but we also set up once again this surface science pack equipment stuff. Of late, you've been seeing me attach this to vehicles, but I decided this time around to set it up the way it was intended, which was to connect it to the ground. Because one of the things, well, one of the reasons I did that is because the surface science pack went through a major upgrade. Uh, and one of those upgrades is that uh, supposedly the whole explosion thing has been fixed. I've been having some issues with the surface science pack exploding on me when I attached it to the ground. And thankfully here, no hitches, no explosions. So I guess maybe this stuff is fixed. Um, and also there's been a change in its functionality. Instead of it just being something that you set up, collect the science, take it apart and then leave, you're supposed to get the experiments running and then they collect science over time that you can transmit back. And you need an engineer and a scientist to get them started with, but then they're supposed to operate on their own. But, uh, well, I kept getting this error here. Calibrate? Oops, something went wrong with the SCP equipment. Well, that's not a particularly helpful error message. Yeah, I never did resolve this. I, I, I'm not sure if I'm doing something wrong or if it's an issue that I don't have power on this thing right now because we are in the dark. I, mean, I did get Wilman to set up some solar panels anyway, but, uh, well, we're in the dark, right? So they're not going to work. Or maybe this equipment is just kind of borked because... They were in the game before the update, and maybe the update messed it up. Maybe I need to bring up some new equipment. But well, I didn't have the patience to spend too much time with it. I didn't even have the patience to pack it all up again. So, uh, well, I left it. <laughs> I left it all behind and just took off and got the science that I could have just and just left it. Uh, man, I'll, I'll deal with it later. Uh, maybe maybe we'll send some scientists down here or some some Kerbals down here to try and see if we can get this going once there's some sunshine or Maybe I'll just bring up some new I don't know, but I was kind of done with it. So I left it behind Now the lab module that is on this station is a KSP interstellar extended Lab module. It's a pretty beastly thing to get up here or heavier than the uh, stock lab module but it does do something that the stock lab module doesn't do. You see, Burke here, having gone down to the surface, 
should now be level two. Normally I need to bring him down to the surface of Kerbin in order to get him up to level two, but I have this feature built into this lab module. There we go, Burke is now level two. Now that is a handy thing. Boy, this would be a great thing to bring on interplanetary expeditions. Now one of the reasons why I'm eager to push this game forward is because my Kerbal Construction Time Building Queue has got quite the backlog happening as you can see here and this happened I think because when I went to version 1.2 a few episodes ago uh, I lost my part inventory so all these vessels are taking longer to build than they normally would. So I just want to push this forward, get these vessels built, get them out. That will start to build up my part queue, my part inventory, which will hopefully mean that future builds won't be quite as much as this. Anyway, let's get on to some of the other things that are going to be happening in this episode. I think actually the highlight with this episode is I'm going to be rendezvousing with an A-class asteroid, which I have a contract to get back to uh, into orbit about Kerbin. Um, and the other thing we'll be doing is getting the Karayan 1, which we see here, coming in towards Kerbin. Uh, this has got Gilly, Bill, Carol, and Bob on it. And I need to uh, bring these guys back to Kerbin Station. All of them are going up to level 3, by the way. Now, if you've forgotten about these folks, I don't blame you. They're in day 21 of this mission to exit Kerbin's sphere of influence and come back simply to up their experience. And like I said, all of them are going up to level three, so mission successful well, level three, if I can get them back down to the surface that is. And oh, after this arrow breaking, I had myself a moon encounter. Well, let's see what we can do with this. Maybe we'll turn this into a bit of a gravity assist, getting the moon to help us slow down a little bit. I need to burn prograde in order to get my trajectory onto the right side of the moon. I need to come around the moon retrograde, of course, in order to get the moon to slow me down. Okay, so that's got my periapsis with Kerbin to 45 kilometers. My closest approach to the moon is 348 kilometers. And we'll be there in just under a day, so we'll revisit these folks just a little bit later in this episode but right now the Kegel 4 is once again on descent on its way down to another location this time it is moon arch number two this is the third of three moon arches on the moon to finish off a contract though I do want to draw attention to this lovely high-res altimetry scan being brought to me by ScanSat the detail there is just fantastic. And this time we sent Wilman over to investigate the anomaly. Oh, the message is from Jean. Hmm, this would make some pretty good goalposts. Maybe we should set up a sporting event. Mudball, anyone? Mudball? The hell is mudball? Anyway, this was 885,000 curb bucks for the completion of this contract, so, uh, that was a big one. That should help a little bit with my liquidity. I was getting a little bit tight for funds. Mostly just in buying new parts. I got so many new parts. I really want this. Like, again, I got to clear the building queue. I got, like, uh, oh, uh, thermal rockets and nuclear generators all from Kerbal Interstellar Extended and uh, power transmission parts and all this really, really cool stuff. But it's going to have to wait till I clear out what's in the building queue right now. Hopefully, though... That won't take too long, again, if I just keep pushing forward. Anyway, we filled up the Kegel 4 once again. But this time, you know, all good things have to come to an end. The fuel barge, well, that was going to be it. It wasn't going to be able to fill it up once again. It only had a tiny bit of fuel left, so it was time to deorbit this thing. We're going to have one more landing to go. This time it was TMA6. I'm going to use ScanSat here to time warp to my target. You know, one of the issues, I keep depending on ScanSat to sort of line up these descents, but one of the issues with ScanSat and for map view is ScanSat doesn't show me what's in the dark and what's in the light, what's in the day side and what's on the night side. And so I end up usually not figuring out that I'm on the night side of the moon until I'm at a beyond the point of no return. I can't figure, oh my gosh, I'm on the night side. Well, I guess I'm landing in the dark. Uh, boy, it would be really cool 
if Scansat actually shaded it so you could see what was in the night side, what was in the dark side. Ooh, that would be really neat. But maybe I should just flip the map view too. I could always do that. Oh, I found one. I found one, says Shell Cal. Okay, well, boy, we're still quite a ways away. <laughs> Well, I guess we might as well just turn around and head back. We've seen lots of monoliths before. And, uh, yeah, that finishes off that contract. That's all we needed to do. No reason to put down. In fact, uh, yeah, Shelkal's going to be running out of propellant before he gets back. So let's open up his inventory. We'll do a mid-flight refuel here. Refuel. Done. Full. All right. And unfortunately, that's going to have to conclude the adventures of Burrick, Shelkal, and Wilman on the surface of the moon. I mean, we got enough fuel to get them back to the station, of course. But that's going to have to be the end of it, because with our fuel reserves spent, we're just going to leave. I'm I, I could get them back with the Karayan. The Karayan definitely has enough fuel to get them back. But you know what? I can. They're not going to level up. I'm able to level them up here. I'm just going to leave them here. they got plenty of, re of uh, supplies and they have space. I'm going to leave them in orbit about the moon. And at some point in the future, we'll send up some more uh, resources. And I think we've got one more of those TMAs to land at. And that's going to finish off those contracts. And then we're going to concentrate on collecting science. But obviously, that's going to have to be... For future episodes, right now, we need to get the Korion 1 back home. Which is actually not too far away from Yoi Station at this current moment, as it steals a little bit of inertia from the moon. Using the moon to help slow it down a little bit. You know, if this thing had more Delta V, I actually would have considered bringing it to Yoi Station. But as it is, this is the best that I can do. And once this was over with, I dropped over to the KSC because I have been pulling in a bit of funds and see what I can do with it. And I spent 1.3 million to begin the upgrading process on the space plane hangar, and which I almost immediately regretted. See, the thing is, half a mil would have gotten me another scientist. And with two scientists on their way to EVE and two on their way to Dres, I only have four scientists in the Kerbin system and three lab modules that I now have up in space. I would love to populate them, but oh well. Next time I'm up to around that kind of money, I guess that's what I will do. In the meantime, Cryon 1 continued with its arrow breaking procedure. You know, I've had this vessel for a long, long time. I'm really thinking of mothballing it now that I got this better nuclear stuff all coming up. Uh, not just better engines, but also better propellants as well. But it'll have to wait. For now, the Korion 1 is going to remain in service. And a few days after all this, we are docking with Kerbin Station. And since all four of these are going to be leveling up, I need to get them down to the surface. All four of these Kerbals, that is. So we'll load them into one of our Dream Chasers here. And descend down to the surface. And I'm finding, I, I spent too much, I came up short, I'll say that right now. I spent too much time in this sort of drag mode, uh, trying to slow myself down, and I forgot, you know, uh, how light this thing is. It's such a tiny little vessel that it slows down very quickly, and I didn't have enough momentum to get myself to the runway. It, I, maybe this is making an excuse, and if it is, well, it probably is making an excuse, but I do find it hard going between, you know, a Mark III shuttle, which is a very heavy vehicle, it takes a long time to slow down, and then this is at the other extreme. That little explosion right there, that was just a uh, an RCS port. No main damage done, so I went with it, recovered these folks, and look at that. All of them are now up to level 3. Boy, I got a lot of cripples now down at the surface. I need to start getting people back up, but for that, well, I need to keep pushing forward. So, onwards to Minmus Driller 2. This had an inauspicious launch a couple of episodes ago, and it's coming up towards its apoapsis. It's meant to go to Minmus and land on the surface. How far away are we from Minmus? Let's use, uh, here, Rendezvous. Ooh, 6,600 kilometers. 
Okay, what's the range on the Communitron that I have here? See, because of the foul-up that I discovered last episode, the Communitron is my only means of communication. What's the range? Come on, you can click on it. Here we go. 5,000 kilometers. Oh, we are getting closer to it. Oh, this should work. Yeah, right now I do not have a signal, so this probe is dead, but we are getting closer and closer to Minmus all the time. So let's just time warp forward and... Oh, 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 there we go. There is our connection. I have communication satellites and mapping satellites in orbit around Minmus. It's relaying out off of something. I really don't care what. Why don't I get that dish antenna extended and point that towards Kerbin? Now, this thing, thanks to a botched uh, injection a couple of episodes ago, I'm not even sure it has enough fuel in order to get a capture around Minmus, let alone land on Minmus. But the problem is, is that its orbit is intersecting the moon's orbit. Eventually, the moon's going to mess it up entirely. So what I want to do is just make an inclination change so that uh, hopefully it won't intersect with the moon's orbit and then sometime in the future I can send out some Kerbals out here and they can refuel this thing and then it can go on with this mission. There we go, it's only about 25 meters per second. That ought to do it. And I'll perform this burn a little bit later and, in the, and we're not going to be getting back out to this until some episode out in the future. So Right now, I need to get an asteroid. This is the RMB, which is actually the vessel that is responsible for getting asteroid joy that we're seeing prominently earlier in this episode. This vessel is the one that brought it into orbit about the moon, and then we refueled it up, and now we're sending it off after another asteroid. This is just an ACAST class asteroid, asteroid JUP968. I think once I get it, I'll call it Asteroid Jupe. And the mission is just to get it into orbit about Kerbin, and yeah, I might do something more with it after that as well. We're working with, because of our distance from Kerbin, about a third of a second signal delay. So I figure I'll use the flight computer from Remote Tech to handle some of these burns. The first one being just a tiny little burn to bring my encounter distance down to 0.7 kilometers. We're going to be there in just under three hours. Our encounter speed is 847 meters per second. So let's time warp until we're about half an hour away. And then we'll set up a maneuver to knock off about half of this speed. Now I know a lot of this burn has to be prograde relative to the sun because the asteroid's coming in from behind. So that means I'm going to have to speed up in order to match velocity with it. But then the amount of radial I need, or the amount of normal I need, for me at least, was a bunch of guesswork, until I realized a much easier way to do this. What I did is I pointed myself away from the target, just using the icons on the nav ball. And uh, then I could see from this alone that the, uh, the burn has to be pretty much equally split between prograde and radially out. And then all I need to do is get it so that the maneuver node ends up pointing away from the asteroid. Uh, I can see I need a little bit of normal here just to get it right on there. And then I kept going until like the amount of the burn was about half of my relative velocity, so that should knock off about half of, uh, of my velocity that I have right now. And I ended up with this 408 meter per second burn, which got my encounter even closer than it was before. And even if you lose those closest approach indicators, which often happens on these long distance rendezvous, this technique will still work. You don't need the closest approach indicators. As long as you keep the amount of the burn well less than um, your relative velocity with your target, you should be doing pretty close to the right thing in order to accomplish a rendezvous. Anyway, once this burn was done, uh, time warped till I was just about five minutes away. No more maneuver nodes now. I'm just going to point away from the target and burn. And this time I'm just doing it manually, keeping an eye on the information given to me by better burn time. I want to make sure that my closest approach to the target doesn't get too far apart and that my distance from the target, I don't push it too far away. 
And if I feel things are getting a little bit too far apart, all I gotta do is cut my burn, time warp a little bit closer, and then just repeat. We now have the uh, waypoint there. The asteroid's less than 50 kilometers away. Okay, let's cut engines. All right, so our relative velocity is down to 147 meters per second. We're just over five minutes away from our target. The rest of this is easy, so let's cut ourselves a little bit closer. Oh, damn. The asteroid is rotating. I guess I didn't have persistent rotation installed the last time I did this. Okay, well, I'll we'll have to go for it anyway. Okay, we'll arm the claw. Oh, man, look at it tumble. Okay, okay, we're about 100 meters away, so... Uh, yeah, we better start reducing our velocity here. Reduce our relative velocity to half a meter per second and spin around. And it turned out that the uh, rotating asteroid was no big deal. Since it's rotating around its center of mass, because that's what objects do when they're free to rotate, the center of mass doesn't move. And you point, the, uh, you point your vessel at the center of mass whenever you're doing this sort of a thing, so you just keep the vessel pointed at the center of mass and you just zoom right in on your target. I use RCS to keep the prograde vector onto the target. Just got to move laterally up a little bit and a little bit to the left. Yeah, there we go. And then it's just riding this thing in, correcting every once in a while. Not too different from docking, really. And latch. Oh, turn the RCS off. Oh, best kill the flight computer, too. There we go. And remote tech always gets so confused <laughs> when, you, when you do things like docking and stuff like that. So we'll just let this tumble a little bit. Oh, we're coming into the dark side of the asteroid. Let's uh, try putting on the SAS here. So we can bring this under control. We seem well, really attached to it well. All right, let's point ourselves away from the sun. Oh, we're really slugging this thing around. Let's turn on the extra set of reaction wheels. Those ones are on. Okay, let's turn these ones on. Now we got double reaction wheels here. Oh, we are nicely firmly attached. Oh, and according to Kerbal Engineer, we have over 1,900 meters per second of Delta V still left. Capture should be easy. There we go. Nice exposure on the solar panels. All right. Okay, so we got to get a capture around Kerbin. Now, in the past, you have seen me have some adventures arrow breaking asteroids. Um, I'm convinced that this is a heat issue, not a aerodynamic pressure type of issue. Apparently, KSP asteroids are pretty good conductors of heat. <laughs> Rock shouldn't be a good conductor of heat, but I think the whole asteroid gets hot uniformly, and then any parts attached to the asteroid, they get hot, and then things start to explode. So this time, I'm not going to do anything cute. Um, I just want to get my capture. So I'm just going to look for my periapsis here and uh, do a maneuver node and just get my capture. I kind of want to keep my options about going to the moon open too. I'm thinking of taking this asteroid to asteroid Yoy, kind of clicking them together, you know, Tinker Toy style. <laughs> That's what I kind of have in my head. So I'd like to keep that option open. Okay, I got my descending node is now right on the moon's orbit. I don't have an encounter, but I should be able to finagle encounter out of this. Capture's only 163 meters per second, so I certainly am gonna have lots of fuel left over. But you know, getting that capture, that's going to have to be for a future episode. In the meantime, I thank you for watching and hope to see you again next time.